I'm so honored um, and humbled to stand here um, this morning and be able to open the Word of God with you. Um, I just believe God is, in, is, is bringing us into a journey. All of us are on a journey. Every one, of, every one of you, all of our journeys are different, but they all have a purpose. Everybody in this room, your journey may have been from some other country or some other state and somehow you ended up here this morning. Your journey is in different professions and different occupations. Some of you have kids, some of you don't. Some of you are single and hoping to be married. Some of you are like, thank good, thank goodness I'm single. Some of you love and, and your, your marriage is thriving and some of your marriages, you're just having a, a hard time. Some of, some of you have kids, I mean, they're perfect, unlike mine that are not, but they're great kids. This is my son in this picture. Got to take him to Colorado last year, and we were, this is the Rocky Mountain National Park, and I was just caught in a moment seeing my son sitting on this wood bench looking over Bear Lake and the Rocky Mountain National, Rocky Mountain National Park. I was overwhelmed with God in this moment. I said, oh God, would you use him to increase the kingdom? Would, oh God, would you let him see that his journey has purpose, it has fullness, it has completeness in you and not in anything else. And that's my same hope for you and, and for, even for myself this morning. And if you're here on this campus or if you're listening online, man, my hope is that you will see that all of us are on a journey and that God is inviting us in. He wants us, he wants to, he wants us to be used and in, in a day, in an age, whenever there are options that are unlimited, you can literally touch the other side of the planet within seconds just by pulling out your cell phone. I'm not saying try it while I'm preaching. Uh, I'm just saying it is an opportunity you have in front of you. There's opportunities now. You go to an office or you work from home. There's opportunities to work or not work. There's opportunities all, all around us. You are literally connected everywhere to the planet all at one time. There's opportunities to share the gospel with your neighbor or to not. There's opportunities to join God and the mission that he has and the purpose he has for your life, or there's opportunity to say no. I'm not saying those are right. What I'm saying is there's always an opportunity, it seems like, right in front of us. It's just an opportunity. I mean, if there's anything that we learned over the last two years, then anything can, and everything can change in an instant, right? Work can change in an instant. Your health can change in an instant. I was here um, just a, a year ago, just a couple weeks earlier than this, and... Um, my dad was going through a sickness, and my dad's my hero. And about a week later, a week this coming Saturday, it'll be one year since I lost my dad. Everything, now, listen, I, yes, I am sad in the flesh when I'm happy in the kingdom because I know that my dad is there. So I'm content with that. What I'm telling you is that things can change, right? Things can change in an instant. Activity, social lives, church life. I mean, and I know Florida's a little different, but I travel all the country, right? And so churches can change because you got to go online for a little while and pivot and figure out what does that look like? How do we do that? Do we attend? Do we come back to church? Thank goodness for Florida and Texas, right? That's where I live. Your family, the dynamics can change. I know there's some of you, you've just been engaged in this last year. Man, everything's about to change. Marriage is fantastic, by the way. Some of you, man, you've, you've lost loved ones. Things can change, but it's still a part of your journey. I think the question that we have to ask, and whenever we begin to think about those, and we begin to peek into Joshua 1, is what really matters? I mean, that's a question we really got to ask, right? What, what really matters? I mean, not, not that all these things, I mean, even, even now, right? It, not just the past two years, but let's just talk about what's going on right now. We have a war in Ukraine that's gut-wrenching to watch. It's like I can't... I can't stop watching it and learning and praying and hoping. We've got COVID still lingering around doing something somewhere, but not in Florida. <laughs> Man, my first trip after being stuck at home and not being able to travel 15 weeks was to Cape Coral, Florida, and I was praising the Lord. As soon as I got off that airplane, I was like, a mask gone. It seems like truth is under attack from every angle. It's just what it seems like. And there's so much more, but listen, all those influence our lives, but I just believe none of those have to define us. It's the Lord that defines our path. I mean, what's life really about? These are big questions that I can't, you know, I'm going to ask them, and I'll let Pastor Neil and Pastor John deal with these. But is life something we just make up as we go? 
doing the best we can with what we have? Do we just figure it out as we go? Is there a true way to know joy and purpose, satisfaction, how to make a lasting difference? That's what I want my life and my kids' life to be about. I just want to know that my life mattered for the kingdom. Is there something more to life? I mean, these are questions that we may ask. You may be sitting in the room, first time in a long time you've been in church, like, is there more? We all know, most of us know the answer is yes. Is there something beyond this life? Absolutely. What am I going to do with my life? What can I do? I just believe that the strength of God is revealed through the Word of God, and it's sealed by the presence of God. The strength of God is revealed, and that's what we're going we're gonna to look at this morning in Joshua chapter 1. We're going to be in, diving into Scripture, but I just, I just want us to think about the journey as, we, as we're on our, that we're in in our life and as we consider how the Lord calls Joshua to take up the mantle of Moses, leading the Israelites. We know the Israelites were held in captivity in Egypt, um, Moses, and I'll go through a list here of all the things, or well, not all, but most of the accomplishments or the, the things that Moses was a part of that we know, and then how Joshua took up the mantle. But let's read in, in verse 1. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death, the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that your soul of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I want us to stop there for just a few minutes, and I want us to look at this, this, this phrasing in verse 1 of, after the death of Moses, the servant, and then you have Joshua, the assistant. Moses has, I mean, Moses has a whole list of things, right, as he served the people of Israel. I mean, here's just a highlight reel of a few things. Uh, he survived his birth as a Hebrew slave. He was found in a river basket. Um, by the one, by the one that was actually enslaving the Hebrews, the Israelites, he was actually the one um, that was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, the same Pharaoh that was enslaving the Hebrews, killing an Egyptian, killing an Egyptian as a young man and running away to start a new life in the wilderness, being called by God to go back to Egypt, telling the telling the Pharaoh to let his people go. Everybody knows the song, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh baby, let my people go. Right? I know Rob knows that one. I should ask him to play that one. Performing miracles. And warning of plagues like no prophet had ever done. These are just a few things Moses did. Leading the freed Israelites out of Egypt as, a former, as former slave owners gave the jewelry, begging them to leave. <laughs> Seeing the Egyptian army swallowed by the Red Sea. By the way, the gospel is right in the middle of that Red Sea. Where there is no way, God makes a way. His name is Jesus. Delivering the Ten Commandments. We know that one well. In God's handwriting, plus other laws and books of the Bible, organizing the 12 tribes of Israel, including the priestly responsibilities and sacrificial systems, directing the construction of the tabernacle and its furnishings, eating manna from heaven and drinking water from a rock, and several other things. Moses was a leader, but he was also um, a reluctant leader. He was reluctant. We also know that as the Israelites came out of captivity, out of Egypt, um, even though all these things had happened before them, they began to complain. Why do we do that? The Lord has gone before us, most of us in the room, He has saved us, and somehow we still say, Lord, why not fill in the blank? For me, over the past year, it was like, Lord, why did you take my dad? I know that you don't really know me, but I, I'm typically just pretty transparent. I've struggled with that. But I look at the Israelites... And I look at Moses, and Moses dies, and they don't get to go into the, into the promised land, but God always has a plan. Amen. Always. Now let's look at not Moses the servant, but Joshua the assistant. What was happening while Joshua was an assistant? You know, oftentimes we think, oh, God has forgotten me. God has no idea where I am. 
Now listen, I know we're in Gulf Breeze, Florida, and God's, this is like God's promised land, right? Because it's beautiful. I mean, look at the trees outside of the building, right? I mean, you go, you got palm trees coming in as you're, walk, as you're coming in your drive. You're, what, five minutes from the beach? I mean, it's pretty good here. Right? Like, I, feel like I'm in the, I feel like I'm in the wilderness in Texas. It's just sand everywhere, but it's not pretty white sand. It's just sand that's just dirty. Just makes your trucks just dirty. You come here, I'm like, wow, this is really pretty. Neil, are you hiring? You know, that whole thing. <laughs> and then your bridge reopened. I'm like, oh, this is good. This is good. What was happening? What was happening with Joshua? Well, he was one of the 12 spies sent to Canaan. And he was one of, the two, one of the two that came back with the promising report. <laughs> he, was, he accompanied Moses he accompanied Moses up Mount Sinai part of the way. Not the whole way, but part of the way. He was staying close to the one that he was serving beside. He was there. He joined Caleb to exhort the people to trust God for victory. He was being prepared. I mean, that's what was happening. You know, there is a time of waiting and a time of development and a time of maturing and a time of growth. And we live in a culture where everything, even from the youngest student to the oldest adult in here, we live in an instant generation. We live in an instant culture where everything is supposed to happen right now. Are we okay with waiting as long as we know that God sees us and is with us? He has not forgotten that you're in Gulf Breeze, Florida, by the way. Or wherever you live. He knows exactly where you are. He's not forgotten the number of hairs on your head. He knows, well, some of you, he didn't have to count long. But like God, <laughs> I got all kinds of preacher jokes, y'all. And so like, you know, the reality is like God has not forgotten. He did not misplace you. He's not sitting there going, what did I do with TJ? I can't remember. I know that I, know that I created him. Where did I put him? He's not doing that with anyone in the room. He knows exactly where you are. Whatever age and stage you are in life, it's still an opportunity to prepare. It's still an opportunity. All of our journeys are different, but they all have an opportunity to understand that God is inviting us in. God's inviting us in into the mission God is inviting you into purpose. God is, God is inviting you in into joy in Him. God is inviting you in into an opportunity to go and reach this community all the way to the nations. But maybe it starts in your own household. Maybe it's you that needs to surrender your life for the first time today. But God is inviting you in on this journey, and he developed Joshua over time so that he could go and lead the people actually into the promised land. It didn't come without hardships, but he still went in. He took the people there. God is developing you, and he's created you, and he is constantly developing you. He has not forgotten you, and he is ready to send you. The question is, when God calls you, are you willing to be obedient in that call? Whatever it may be. And it's not oftentimes we think, oh, well, you know, God may be sending me to Africa. I hope he does. But I also hope he sends you to the person that works in the cubicle next to you. I, I get to preach at mission conferences all the time. And I always just say, even with Mission Hope, who I serve literally, my job is to invite you to come to international mission. Please don't come to international mission if you're not willing to go next door. Please, go talk to the people that work at gas stations, at Walmart, at wherever you're going to lunch this afternoon. You see, that's God in preparation and sending you to the people because God just might be calling a Joshua and that person you talk to. Or maybe you're Joshua. There's 140-something plus students that are going to the camp this week. Pray for me. <laughs> I was a student pastor for 20 years. Whew. And now I have two teenagers of my own. Still don't have any idea what I'm doing. Are you willing to invest into them as the next Joshua's? Husbands, are you willing to invest in your wives? Wives, the, the opposite is true as well. Are we willing? 
Because you see, God, God, he appointed, Je- he appointed Joshua to be the next leader. Moses commissioned him. He's known as being full of spirit and wisdom because of what? The preparation that took time. It wasn't instant that he became the leader of, of Israel. It was at the death of Moses that Joshua took up. And wouldn't you know it, that at the end of Joshua's life, when you finish out the book of Joshua, it's now talking about his death and he's handing it off as well. And he's known as a servant. If you want to lead, you serve. If you want to be and understand the invitation that God has brought in you, understand that he came to serve so that you and I, once we meet him, we can go and serve as well. Missions is not just about the other side of the planet, and it's not just about Haiti and the Dominican Republic and wherever else Mission of Hope is. That's not what missions is about. Missions is about taking Jesus everywhere you go. That's the invitation to send us. Wherever you go, go make disciples. That's the hope. It's amazing that God would use us as his plan to go and interact with the world, to share the hope of Jesus with all of them. God's using us. He wants to use us. But listen, to tell you this, like, I know, okay, so there's the, there's the preacher, like, okay, that's good, TJ, great. Well, Scripture keeps going. Verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause the people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according all to the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your, pros- you, your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. It's one thing to talk about understanding and, and, and obeying the invitation but it's another thing to actually do it. We can talk all day, but the question is, will we do it? And whenever we go into this, I love that God knows that we are humans and we need a little bit of encouragement. Be strong and courageous. This is not just necessarily physical strength. No, this is, this is strength that comes from the Lord. And you see, I, I just believe that God has called us to a place where it's going, especially in our world right now, it will take strength and it will take courage to stand for Jesus wherever you go. It will. And, you know, the opposite, man, it's, you know, there's an opportunity. If Scripture's saying be strong and courageous, that means God knows there's an opportunity to be weak and to be afraid. It's there. Opportunities abound. They're everywhere. Be strong and courageous. Why? Here's some promises. I love when God gives promises that we can also call that our own, right? Right? For you shall cause. Those four words are are incredibly important because it reminds us, and it should remind us, that our journey, your journey, is a movement. Your journey requires action. Your faith requires you to go and do and to speak and to say. Our journey requires us to have a, a, a posture of submission to the Lord, submitting to his mission and saying, Lord, I accept the invitation. Yes, Lord, I want you and I want to take you wherever I go. Lord, give me strength. Give me courage because I, TJ, it's easy for me to get afraid or get busy or get preoccupied. It's easy for me to just say, I'll do that later. Um, Lord, it's easy for me to become weak in fear. Lord, give me strength and give me courage. I don't know about you, maybe all of you, you've got strength and courage down, but I think even looking at this, I mean, it's said multiple times here, so I think Joshua, who's about to lead the Israelites, um, he just needed to be reminded multiple times. Be strong and be courageous. But the question is, where we see, for you shall cause, then my question for you is, is, what are you causing? What is the Lord calling you to cause? I don't, all, of our, all of ours are different. We, we feed 121,000 kids every day. We have 72,000 kids on a waiting list that are hungry today. Part of my cause is to get those kids fed. And I'll give my life to that. Because I know when those kids are fed, that affects seven people. The average people in Haiti, the average home in Haiti is seven people in a 25 by 25 foot home. 
And I know if that mom doesn't have to worry about that child being fed, that that mom's going to be open to hearing the gospel. If that mom's open to hearing the gospel, that means that dad is too. That means the other kids in the house. You see, whenever we feed one child, when you packed one meal, or you provided the funding, or you prayed for the meal yesterday, or you prayed for it this morning, or maybe you think about it tomorrow, when you do that, understand that that one meal impacts seven people. If God can take one meal and rescue a whole family, I'll keep going. My son is one of the most creative humans I've ever met. The dude thinks in different wavelengths than me. And I want to fan that flame. Oh, God, use him. My daughter is identical to me, and that's terrifying. <laughs> Everything is a competition. Everything. Everything. <laughs> oh, God, use that drive and that passion to go change the world. What is God calling you to cause? That it's beyond your own human ability, and it's going to take God's strength and courage to send you, for you to be obedient to the call. But God gives us guardrails. He says, be careful. I love that God's not like, hey, just go. Like, go figure it out. He said, no, no, be careful. Because he knows Joshua and his leadership could probably just kind of go because Joshua seems like the guy, he, he's over here fighting battles and, and he's coming back and he's a, a spy and he's coming back to give reports like, we can do it, Moses, we can do it. You know, and he's like, hey, can I walk up the mountain with you? Most like, I don't think you're really, he goes, halfway. Is that, can I get at least halfway? He's kind of pushing the envelope just a little bit. God's like, be careful what you do. Listen, if the vision and mission or the purpose or whatever the word is that you want to use for your life, if it does not align with the word of God, and the only way you're going to know if it does, the only way you're going to know if it aligns or doesn't align with the word of God is mean you're meditating on the word of God and you're putting it in your life and it's part of your cycle of your brain. You're just thinking about it. It's constant in your mind. You feel it beating in your heart when your hands go to serve. The word of God has something to do with your hands. The only way you're going to know if your vision and mission, your purpose, your plan, whatever it is, the word that you call that's sending you, the conviction that sends you forward in your life, the only way you're going to know if it aligns with the word of God is by knowing the word of God. And I think, I just believe in the scripture, God is giving Joshua the blueprint for us to live out our daily lives too. Because Joshua is taking on a large cause, as we know. It's part of our spiritual heritage too. He says, do it according to the law of Moses. Listen, I know that's Old Testament. I know that's, that, that's, that's previous version. We're like, well, I don't know. No, no, no. We have the whole, we got all 66 books now, y'all. We got all of them. Yes, it is historical, but it's also active and alive and breathing. Amen. And whenever we put it in our soul, whenever we let it, whenever we let it sit in our mind and come out of our mouth and use our hands and our feet, and it aligns with the word of God, you found your mission. You found it. Wherever you go. Be careful. It's a warning. I don't know what you're doing with your life. I don't, I don't know what, what you're pursuing, what, what your pursuit of the Lord is. And I, I don't know where you work. And I, I, don't know, I don't know much about any of you, really. But I know that this is true for all of us. Be careful. And know that you can follow the law, you can follow the scripture, you can follow the truth that's found in the Bible because it is our life. And it's clear. It's not overcomplicated. This book should not depart from your mouth, but you meditate on it and you're diving in on it. TJ, man, I've never really done Bible study. Listen, I, I know one thing about Pastor Neil. He is the most analytical and process-oriented human I've ever met in my life. Like, the word SHOP is an acronym. I'm like, it's the, SHOP was where I stored the tractors. It's like, students, honing, occupy. I'm like, what? I guarantee you this church has resources that can help you get started on your journey of knowing the word so that you can have the guardrails of the direction you're headed. The YouVersion Bible app's got thousands of devotions. There's, there's resources everywhere. TJ, I don't know how to study. Go to the book of John and start there. Get in a small group. Find community. Get people that will walk with you. 
do it. To be on mission, we've got to be in the Word of God. To have strength and courage, we have to be in the Word of God because that's where it is revealed. That's where we find it. If it wasn't for the Word of God, if it wasn't for Philippians 3.14, I don't know that I would have made it through this last year still in ministry. It was the Word of God that rescued me and the people that God surrounded me with. God is for you. He has not forgotten where you are. He's invited you in to the mission and vision that he has for Gulf Breeze and the surrounding area all the way to the ends of the earth, starting in your next, with your next door neighbor or maybe even your own house. God has given you strength and courage. The question is, will you embrace the strength and courage that's available to you? Because oftentimes, men, we like to have our own strength, don't we? <laughs> I can fix it. I grew up on a cattle farm. I can fix everything. Until I wake up last Thursday, a week ago Thursday, and I had a little tension in my back. And then Friday morning, I went to go get on an airplane to go to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Ugh, that's place. <laughs> I'm a Razorback. I'm not a Roll Tide, man. Come on. I know I made some enemies. Well, you need to get saved. <laughs> Friday, I was having to lean on my suitcase to walk. Like there is an excruciating amount of pain going down the front of my leg right now, and I have no idea what's going on. Then I had to go to the Dominican Republic, then I came here, then I'm going to do camp. Again, pray for me. And then I'm going back to Little Rock, and then finally I'll go get to see a doctor. But I'm praying the Lord just heal it. But it's amazing whenever we try to do things in our own strength, how God would just say, you know what? You need my strength. Because as a human, our strength will always fail. And then we become Christian schizophrenics. I can fix it. I can do it. Oh, I failed. I'm no good to God. God's like, no, no, I will restore you. I can do it. All right, now I'm going to take over again. Let me put the reins back in my hand. TJ, it's me. We have to be able to embrace what God has available for us, and the only way you're going to find that is seeking after him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, with all of your strength. That's how you're going to find him. God makes promises, though. I love this. Do not turn from the left to the right. It's still the warning that you may have good success. How do you define success? There's all kinds of ways. And I know there's, there's ways that are, that are appropriate for each area of life, but the ultimate success is finding your strength and your courage in the presence of God. Because He is enough. He is enough because, see, when Joshua passed over into, uh, whenever he passed over the Jordan and he went into the promised land, it wasn't, you know, just, it didn't look like this. He immediately had to go to Jericho. <laughs> you would have thought, people, people probably thought it was crazy. They're marching around in silence. What? But God's promises remained true, didn't they? They yelled, they blew the horns, and it fell down because God is faithful. It's God. It's always God. You see, God's the hero of the story. God is the one that is the one that is the calling you. It's not just that you're calling yourself or you're figuring out your own. No, you're never alone because God is with you. And he's going to invite you in. He's going to give you strength. He's going to give you courage whenever you surrender and submit your life fully to him. Say, so, Lord, I just want you and you alone. You are enough. You're enough. Verse 9, last verse. Have I not commanded you? Joshua 1 verse 9. Have I not commanded you? It's like God has to continue to remind Joshua. Apparently Joshua and I have some similarities. Stubborn. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Here we go again. Be strong and courageous. Hey, listen, I know that whenever you really, when we put our yes on the table with the Lord, that the enemy does not like that, and he's going to come after you. I also know that sometimes we just come after ourselves with our own doubt and our own fears and our own discouragement. We often hear the voices in our head say, you can't. You know, you're not, you're not holy enough. You don't, you don't know enough of the Bible. You know, you don't, man, that's too big. That, that, you don't have that knowledge. We, we hear all these things, and I just have to think that as, as Joshua's taken on this mantle from Moses, this leadership role from Moses, who was a servant, and he was the assistant, and now 
He's the servant. That, that posture and that placing there had to say, mm, man, can I, I know that I'm full of wisdom and full of the Spirit, but this is a lot. God says, no, 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 be strong and courageous. But then he qualifies this. Not, it's not just that he stops there. He says, the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Don't be frightened. The enemy loves to scare us. He loves to scare us to think that we can't or that people will judge us. Who cares? Who cares? I want to honor the Lord with everything that I got, everywhere I go. I'm not perfect, but I know His grace is sufficient. And I will keep going. Why? Because I can be strong and courageous. Why? Because He is strong and He's the definition of courageous. And He's placed Himself through the power of the Holy Spirit in me to send me. And the same is true for you. It's not just preacher talk. The only thing that makes me different from you is that I'm elevated about 20 inches. For some reason, God chose me to encourage you with this and to say, man, be strong and courageous, not because TJ said so, but because the Scripture says so. Be strong and courageous. Why? Because the Lord is with you wherever you go. Hey, listen, don't be frightened. The enemy wants to scare you to miss out on the mission and the plan that God has for your life. But listen, the enemy cannot defeat our God. And if we know that and we embrace that, then we can be strong and courageous and we don't have to be frightened because we know the enemy is already defeated. We can be strong and courageous and not be dismayed. It means not be discouraged, not be frustrated, not not just be in a place where it's like, ah, give up. No, listen, we can be strong and courageous because the Lord God is with us wherever we go. And in those moments where we have questions, I just believe that the Lord is faithful enough to answer them. It may not be in the timetable that you want, But he is faithful and he will answer because he is with you wherever you go. We often think in our journey that we are alone. You're never alone. You're not alone. You're just not. How do I know that? Time after time after time again in Scripture, we read, and I will go with you. I will go before you. I will be with you wherever you go. The Lord has not forgotten where you are. He has not forgotten your name. He has not forgotten how many hairs are on your head. He has not forgotten the thoughts in your mind. He has not forgotten you, and he absolutely loves you. God's greatest blessing is his presence in our life. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine named Pastor Job. Pastor Job is a Haitian pastor in the Dominican Republic. I just took this picture this week. Pastor Job is, he's a funny little guy, okay? Um, he loves to play keyboard, and he's, he's decent. Um, his keyboard is missing about 12 keys. I'm going to steal Rob's keyboard and see if I can take it down. I mean, I'm going to borrow it, ministerially speaking, all right? <laughs> But man, he just starts, he'll, he'll get on there, man, he'll just be, you know, planking away at it, and it, it doesn't sound real good, probably the speakers are busted, but all of a sudden, he just starts worshiping. He, if there's a guy I know that has an opportunity to be discouraged and be dismayed, it would be Pastor Job. But I was with him this week, and I said, Pastor Job, what's God doing in your life? He was like, everywhere. He's, every, he's doing everything. I was like, what do, you, what do you mean by that? He goes, TJ, people are just meeting in Creole, right? So I can't speak Creole. He's like, God is just, he's rescuing people. God just keeps bringing money. He said, a year ago when I met you, I was eight months behind in rent. All of a sudden, we had somebody come by the church and say, hey, I'll, I'll take care of your rent. I mean, God's just doing crazy things in this guy's church. And it's amazing because he doesn't really have any education. He's a Haitian in Dominican Republic, which is um, a pretty hard situation. Haitians are not... Um, accepted well in the DR. And he's reaching people all over community, not just Haitians, but Dominicans. God is blessing this guy. Why? Because he refuses, he refuses to live in fear. He refuses to be dismayed. And so I was like, I know I'm preaching what this, I know what I'm preaching this week. And I said, where do you find that from? Where do you find your strength from, Pastor Joe? Because I'm inspired, brother. And he just held up his Bible that just had worn edges. The binding was basically torn off. And I was like, do you want a new Bible? He's like, no. He just held up his Bible. He goes, TJ, this is really the only thing that I have that I actually own. He said, this is everything to me. He came over 
to pastor a church because he knew the Haitians were lost in the DR. He's causing people to meet Jesus because he was willing to surrender and let God be his strength, let God be his courage, and to not live in fear and to not be dismayed. What is God causing in you? Now, I do love... I do love the coast, but I'm also a mountain guy. I turned around as I was with my kids, and I just snapped this picture. It's not as good as pictures like Brian can take. I understand that. It's on my iPhone. I was just in awe. I was just in awe of the power of God shining through those mountains. This was down at the base of the Rocky Mountain National Park as we were driving out. And it just put me in a posture of just saying, Lord, whatever you want. If you can throw all this into existence with a word, be yeah, you know everything about me. You intricately made me. God, whatever you want is yours. What about you? Joshua trusted God. And it took him into the promised land. And then he was given the title of servant, which is probably on the earth the greatest title you can get as a follower of Christ, as a disciple of Jesus. God caused him to lead a people. God caused him to be a part of our spiritual heritage. What is God causing in you? What's stopping you from surrendering to it? Church, coastline, put your yes on the table. If you're in the room, you don't know Jesus, man, we'd love to talk to you about that. The greatest thing that ever happened to me was when I was 20 years old, driving through Conway, Arkansas, the sign says Russellville, 43 miles, and I met Jesus on the side of an interstate. It wasn't somebody who preached a great sermon. It wasn't an incredible worship band. I was probably driving way too fast and probably listening to Dr. Dre. But all of a sudden, I met Jesus. Changed my life. If you don't know Jesus, he's inviting you to a relationship with him full of forgiveness, full of hope, full of grace, full of purpose, with an invitation to take that same hope to the world. For the believers in the room, the invitation didn't stop at salvation, but now he's inviting you to more. See, when God speaks, it's an invitation to come closer. And the closer we get to him, the more we get sent out by him. So find God and go live sent.